five. I think that both of us simultaneously cried out and mixed all in wonder, terror, and disbelief in our own senses as we finally cleared the pass and saw what lay beyond. Of course, we must have had some natural theory in the back of our heads to steady our faculties at the moment, for the moment. Probably we thought of such things as the grotesquely weathered stones of the Garden of the Gods in Colorado, or the fantastically symmetrical wind-carved rocks of the Arizona desert. Perhaps we even have thought of the sight of a mirage like that had we had seen the morning before on first approaching those mountains of madness. We must have had such norm some such normal notions to fall back upon as our eyes swept that limitless, tempest-scarred plateau and grasped the almost endless labyrinth of colossal, regular, and geometrically eurythmic stone masses which reared their crumbled and pitted crests above a glacial sheet not more than 40 or 50 feet deep at its thickest and in places obviously thinner. The effect of the monstrous sight was indescribable for some fiendish violation of known natural law cer seemed certain at the outset. Here on a hellishly ancient tableland fully 20,000 feet high and in a climate deadly to habitation since a pre-human age not less than 500,000 years ago they are stretched nearly to the vision's limit a tangle of orderly stone which only the desperate of mental self-defense could possibly attribute to any but a conscious and artificial cause. We had previously dismissed so far as a serious thought was concerned any theory that the cubes and ramparts of the mountain sides were of other than natural in origin. How could they be otherwise when man himself could scarcely have been differentiated from those great apes at the time when the, this region succumbed to the present unbroken reign of glacial death? Yet now the sway of reason seemed irrefutably shaken for this cyclopean maze of squared, curved, and angled blocks had features which cut off all comfortable refuge. It was very clearly the blasphemous city of the Mirage in stark objective and ineluctable reality. That damnable portent had had a material basis after all. There had been some horizontal stratum of ice dust in the upper air, and the shocking sh stone survival had projected its image across the mountains according to the simple laws of reflection. Of course, the phantom had been twisted and exaggerated and contained things which the real source did not contain, yet not as we saw, now as we saw the real source, that we thought even more hideous and menacing than its distant image. Only the incredible, unhuman massiveness of these vast stone towers and ramparts had saved the frightful thing from utter annihilation in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years, had brooded there amidst the blast of a bleak upland. Corona Mundi. roof of the world. All sorts of fantastic phrases sprang to our lips as we looked dizzily down at the unbelievable spectacle. I thought again to the eldritch primal myths that had so persistently haunted me since my first sight of this dead Antarctic world. Of the demonic plateau of the Lang, of the Migo, or abominable snowmen of the Himalayas, of the narcotic manuscripts with their pre-human implications of the Cthulhu cult, of the Necronomicon, of the, and of the 
Hyperborean Legends of the Formless. Sethagiwach. And of the, the worse than formless star spawn association with that semi entity for boundless miles in every direction the things stretch off and with very little thing indeed as our eyes followed it to the right and left along the base of the low gradual foothills which separated from the actual mountain rim we decided that we could see no thing ex at all except for an interruption at the left of the pass through which we had come. We had merely struck at random a limited part of something in a calculable extent. The foothills were more limited, were more sparsely sprinkled with grotesque stone structures. Linking the terrible cities to the already familiar cubes and ramparts which evidently formed its mountain outposts. These latter as well as the queer cave mouths were th as thick on the inner as on the outer of the mountains. The name of Stone Labyrinth consisted of, for the most part, of the walls from 10 to 150 feet in ice clear height and of a thickness varying from 5 to 10 feet. It was composed mostly of prodigious blocks of dark primordial slate, schist, and sandstone. Blocks in as many cases as large as 4 by 6 by 8 feet, though in several places it seemed to be carved out of a solid even bedrock like a Precambrian sleep. The buildings were far from equal in size, there being innumerable honeycomb arrangements of enormous extent, as well as the small, smaller separate structures. The general shape of these things tended to be conical, pyram pyramidal, pyramidal, or terraced, though there were many other perfect cylinders, perfect cubes, clusters of cubes, and other rectangular forms and a peculiar sprinkling of angled edifices, edifices whose five-pointed ground plan roughly suggested the modern fortifications. The builders had made constant and expert use of the principle of the arc and domes have probably existed in the city's heyday. The whole tangle was, monstrous, was monstrously weathered and the glacial surf surface from which the tower projected was strewn with fallen blocks and immemorial debris. Where the glaciation was the transparent, we could see the lower parts of the gigantic piles and notice the ice preserved stone bridges which connected the different towers at varying distances above the ground. On the exposed walls we could detect the scarred places where other and higher bridges of the same sort had existed. Closer inspection revealed countless largest windows, some of which to close the, with shutters of a petrified material originally wood. Though most gate opened in a sinister and menacing fashion. Many of the ruins, of course, were roofless and even with uneven though wind rounded upper edges.
plus others of a more sharply conical or pyramidal model or else protected by higher surrounding structures preserve intact outlines despite the omnipresent crumbling and pitting. With the field grass we could barely make out what seemed to be sculptural decorations and horizontal bands. Decorations including those of the curious groups of dotted whose dots whose presence on the ancient soapstones now assumed a vastly larger significance. In many places, the buildings were totally ruined and the ice sheet deeply riven from various geologic force causes. In other places, the stonework was worn down to the very level level of the glaciation. One broad swath extending from the plateau's interior to a cleft in the foothill was about a mile to the left of the pass we had traversed was wholly free of build from buildings and probably represented we concluded the course of some great river in which in, which in tertiary times millions of years ago had poured through the city in some prodigious subterranean abyss of the great barrier range. Certainly this was all, above all, a region of caves, gulfs, and secret, underground secrets beyond human penetration. Looking back to our sensations and recalling our days in this, at viewing this monstrous survival from eons, we thought pre-human. I can only wonder that we preserved the resemblance of equilibrium, which we did. Of course, we knew that something, chronology, scientific theory, or our own consciousness, was woefully awry. Yet we kept enough poise to guide the plane, observe many things quite minutely, and take a careful series of photographs which may yet serve both us and the world in good stead. In my case, ingrained scientific habit may have helped, for above all my bewilderment and, sci and sense of menace, there burned a dominant curiosity to fathom more of this age-old secret. To know what built beings had built and lived in this incalculably gigantic place, and what relation to the general world of its time or of other things so unique a concentration of life could have had. For this place was no ordinary city. It must have formed the primary nucleus and center of some archaic and unbelievable chapter of Earth's history, whose outward ramifications recalled only dimly in the most obscure and distortedness, had vanished utterly from amidst the chaos of terrene convulsions long before any human race we know had shambled out of apedom. Here sprawled a paleologian megalopolis compared with which the fabled Atlantis and Lemuria, Camorium and Uzzolorum, and Olathoe in the land of Lamar are recent things of today, not even of today, yesterday. A megalopolis ranking with such whispered pre-human blasphemies as Lucia, Wule, Ibn, the land of Minar, and the nameless city of Arabia Desert. I 
As we flew above that tangle of stark titan towers in my imagination, sometimes escaped all bounds of, and roved aimlessly in the realms of fantastic associations, even weaving links betwixt this lost world and some of my own wildest dreams concerning the mad horror at the camp. <laughs> 